I invested maybe one and a half billion dollars. It's all done. It's all gone. I mean, nobody is uh, it's thinking anymore about this markets being the, the next opportunity. The worst thing you can do is like you're ending jet and there were Patriot missiles uh, next to the, the runaway. Okay, that was scary. Okay. <laughs> But you do, you just do Bismillah. I said, anyway, if I die doing this, I probably will become shaheed. I was like a, what you, you cl- would classify as a bad boy before Islam. So Islam makes me a good, a good person and brings back to my parents the son that they didn't have for the previous like seven, eight years. Okay, of, so for them, at least they had a good son. Okay, what do I do? The first thing I do, mama, I said, your financial problems are solved in this moment. From now on, you are on my payroll. And I start, uh, first of all, I give 100,000 euros, because obviously I was earning well, 100,000 euros in her bank account, and then 2,000 euros a month extra. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back to the channel. And with me today, I have got our most popular guest, Ruggiero. Salam. Welcome back, Ruggiero. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam, alaikum salam. And we are here the last episode was in London and yeah. we've decided by popular demand to do the part two here in Dubai. Uh, and it's so cold that we've got we've got the fire yeah. going as well. It's 45 degrees <laughs> outside. It's freezing. <laughs> We're trying to replicate the outside heat inside. Mashallah. So, uh, Ruggiero, it's uh, very nice to have you back on the on the show. And uh, of course, we're, we're now back here in, in Dubai and in the last podcast that we did you teased a little bit about Dubai but we didn't really fully get into it and I thought given that we're here and given that our audience loves Dubai so much we should get into Dubai so tell me when when did you when did you arrive in in Dubai initially so uh, the first time I set foot in Dubai was uh, in 2000 uh, end of 2000 end of 2000 Uh, we uh, had opened an office in 1998. That was the first uh, Islamic finance uh, office for HSBC Amana. And uh, my colleagues were already here. It took me a couple of years to, to, to come the first time. But yes, yeah, this is when I arrived. And uh, I moved here in uh, 2001. So I lived actually here in Dubai from 2001 to 2003. And then uh, I went back to London and uh, I regretted so much uh, coming back to London. Really? Why? So, yeah. Because, I mean, I was obviously coming all the time here, like two weeks in Dubai, two weeks here, two weeks in, uh, in, in, in London and two weeks in Dubai. And I, can, I could see the way the city was growing. And uh, as soon as I had an opportunity in 2009... Uh, I, I I took it and I and I moved back. So what what was Dubai like then? I know it's, it wasn't long ago, but in the context of yeah, things, yeah, no, you know, no. that was a long time yes. ago. So it was very small, and uh, there wasn't really much uh, to do. Uh, the center of the city really was uh, uh, Deira, uh, the creek. Uh, the office was there at the time. And uh, there was uh, Sheikh Zayed Road, some skyscrapers. And then you go a little bit further and there was the free beach and that's it. The Burj, Burj, Burj Al Arab was already there, but uh, from Burj Al Arab onwards, whereas today Marina, it was only free beach. So you were going there and uh, uh, with, your, uh, with your car and just uh, spend the whole day in the, uh, on the beach and doing nothing. Really. So what, so what was it then that kind of took your eye because i mean from what you're saying there was there wasn't much there no there was a vision um but what was it that attracted you here then well i uh, uh was working in islamic finance and uh, dubai uh was uh, a market for us where there were actual uh, muslims that wanted to do islamic finance and uh, it was also the, the head, regional headquarters for, to cover uh, pretty much everywhere else. So uh, we, I was uh, uh, managing uh, the office, I mean, the, the coverage of Qatar, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia. Uh, there was going to Mauritius, uh, uh, Malaysia, uh, Singapore, Brunei. So it was the perfect place to, to, to move the, the Islamic asset management business, which I was building at the time. And what about on the personal level then? Because were you, what was your situation at this time? I was married at the time, yes, I was married. And could you sense, like, could you have predicted or did you predict how Dubai would take off? No. 
I remember that almost uh, 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 one month before leaving, uh, leaving Dubai uh, to go back to London in 2003, I mean, one of the things, I mean, that's how boring it was. We were going driving in front of the Burj Al Arab to watch uh, some fire uh, and light show. Okay, so that's what it is. And on the left of Burj Al Arab was like a free beach. I remember, and I found everything boarded. So some huge mega project had started. And then I left. And then I was coming back. And that was really where the, the, the beginning of, I mean, today is called uh, uh, Mina uh, or Medina Jumeirah. That's the way, what they were building at the time. And then, uh, I mean, again, looking from the, from the, from the window of my, of my apartment in Sheikh Zaid, I could see some, um, some vessels pumping sand in the middle of the sea. This is what these people are doing. <laughs> and they were building the, the, the palm. And then over the years coming back, you could, I could see the Burj, uh, Burj Al Arab that was, uh, sorry, the, the Burj Khalifa. Khalifa. At the time it was called Burj Dubai, by the way, uh, that was coming up. So th you could see that there was a buzz in, in those years. This is when Sheikh Mohammed really had really uh, come to, uh, become the ruler. And he really unleashed uh, this uh, uh, wave of uh, uh, public infrastructure investments uh, that completely transformed the city. So you couldn't tell. At that time, you really couldn't tell. It was just a faith that you wanted to, to, I wanted to work in Islamic finance. There was an office here to do Islamic finance and I moved here. There was absolutely no, I mean, otherwise I would have become a multimillionaire by now, if I knew, because I would have bought all properties at the time. Uh, when they open up the, the freehold for, uh, for non-Emiratis, uh, uh, at the time was the time to buy. Mm. Okay, if, if I really had that foresight, I would have bought like crazy. Mm. But uh, no, I didn't. <laughs> the funny thing is that I remember back in the UK that there, were, there was a lot of hype about the Palm in particular. And there was a lot of people, a lot of uh, scrupulous people as well, that were selling projects uh, here into places like the UK um, and many people felt like they got scammed, but actually, if they maybe if they'd actually seen it all the way through and held it, perhaps they'd be sat on really, really, you know, highly valued properties today, wouldn't they? They would, but uh, <clears throat> believe me, until the depth of the crisis that followed the financial crisis, nobody really believed it. I remember uh, at the time I was in London, and uh, it was two thousand and six, two thousand and seven. And uh, I was traveling with a very famous investor called Jim Rogers. You might have uh, heard of, uh, uh, of him. And uh, um, we were traveling, we, we, we went to give a, a, a presentation at, the, at Atlantis. As we were coming back, and this was really the depth of the uh, financial crisis, uh, he was looking outside uh, and, uh, on, the, on the trunk of the, of the palm and everything was empty. And he said, Ruggiero, I have a feeling that the Dubai real estate market is going to crash. Okay, so he, he, the feeling was that everything is, has been like a waste of money and there is no, no future. But over and over again, Dubai has proven to be uh, uh, able to rebound from every crisis. I mean, the first crisis that we experienced was in 9-11. Mm. I mean, I was here. I mean, I, I, I was in the office uh, and I was on the phone and someone said, uh, Ruggiero, an, an airplane crashed on the, on the World Trade Center. So I went outside because we have a World Trade Center. I said, what are you talking about? There is no plane crashing in the World Trade Center. No, 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 the World Trade Center in New York. So that was okay. This is the end of uh, Islamic finance, okay? And uh, the end of Dubai, the end of everything. Instead, as we were war, from 2001 to 2003, I was traveling, the plane were getting all more and more and more crowded. Because what happened is that a lot of Arabs were scared to keep their money in the Middle East, sorry, in the West, and they repatriated the money to the Middle East and specifically to Dubai. So Dubai boomed. 
So that is the what caused the boom. Then you have the financial crisis. The second financial crisis arrived a little bit later in Dubai, but in the in the in the real estate market crashed again, and again Dubai was able to turn it around. And then we had COVID. Once again, the market crashed, and again every single crisis Dubai end, uh, ended up being uh, stronger than uh, than it was before. And I remember that uh, during COVID. I mean, we said, yes, that's, this is the end of Dubai, okay? But we stay, okay? I talked to my family. Yes, anyway, where are we going? <laughs> we go to Italy to do two years of lockdown. At least here we have uh, freedom. And uh, there, were, uh, there were some big investors, uh, and publicly, I mean, uh, uh, as like uh, Sajwani, the, the, Hussein Sajwani, the, the, the CEO of Damak, he said, to my, Dubai is finished, okay? And then what, what did they do? They open up the city. It was the only city in the whole world open up and Dubai became stronger than it was before. And Sajwani said, I have to admit, okay, I myself, that I'm one of the biggest investors in Dubai, I was wrong. What the, the leadership of Dubai has done during COVID, it was like the, 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 the most... Uh, the, clever, the most clever uh, 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 f- uh, feat that you can possibly imagine. So yeah, Dubai Cup keeps coming back. So next time that there is a crisis, have faith in Dubai and actually come and buy. Yes. And believe me, I never did it. But <laughs> I mean, I have to say that I, I, if I consider myself as my investment, yes, in 2009, when I landed back in Dubai, that was the bottom of the market. Mm-hmm. So I, as a professional, for, from, for my career, I caught one of the bottom. But as a real estate investor, I never really managed to, to catch the bottom. We'll, we'll talk about bottoms in a, in a little while. Okay. Um, what I wanted to, I guess, double click on was this idea of Dubai always rebounding. Yes. And, you know, it's... And, and obviously I've, I've not been here for long, um, but you, there's something intangible about Dubai that you, it's kind of hard to explain, but in your tenure here, in your long time 20. here. Yes. Oh, 20. Yes. 20 years. In your long time here, what, like, what is it? Yeah. What is it? Like, why does Dubai keep rebounding? Because Dubai has cleverly put itself at the pinnacle of, of globalization. A city like Dubai could not exist if there were no free movement of capital, free movement of people, free movement of goods. So Dubai has cleverly put itself at the very pinnacle of the globalization and has been able to thrive from every single crisis that was happening everywhere else. So when things were bad in du- outside of Dubai, things were good in Dubai. When things were good outside of Dubai, things in Dubai were great. So this, this openness to everything, but done in a way that has preserved the, the peace and harmony of the city. Mm. I don't know whether it's a template that you can bring somewhere else, okay? But certainly it's a case study. Mm. This is the new Cordoba. This is the new Cordoba, the new Baghdad. Mm. The thing, or one of the things that I found most surprising having been here for a few months, uh, and I'd love to dis- explore this with you, is Islam in Dubai. Because you scroll through social media, I mean, <laughs> perhaps not your social media, but certainly as somebody that was living in the UK and you get all this stuff in your feed about Dubai and it's basically the kind of tourist experience. And I've come here and I've seen a completely different world. Exactly. Um, what's your story been from an Islamic sense in Dubai? So when I was in, uh, in London, okay, I had uh, this vision that I'm going to Dubai, I'm going to, be, to, to, to rent a very humble Arabic villa with no furnitures. I will live on the floor. I will live a, a very simple life. Okay. When I came here, the reality is that uh, you start uh, seeing these new apartments coming up. So you, you, you like a little bit of the, of the luxury. Okay. And it's uh, within reach. Okay. You come, you start not paying taxes. And obviously, you have a lot of disposable uh, income. So you can easily... Uh, incru- improve your uh, uh, your lifestyle but the thing is that apart from uh, some very limited uh, tourist hotspots 
okay, like uh, you go to the Burj Khalifa and there is a place where everybody is taking uh, uh, pictures uh, uh, or uh, in Marina and there is this hotspot where people go with, uh, with, uh, with their yachts. Okay, the city is really, I mean, you can feel Islam everywhere. Okay, there is no other place where I would be in Ramadan. Ramadan has to be uh, Dubai. Okay, so uh, uh, and so so you you can really as a Muslim you really live uh, in uh, in peace here. Okay, you have uh, a mosque every two hundred or three hundred meters. Wherever you 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 turn, there is a mosque. Okay, uh, uh, the city it's free of crime. Okay, you can leave the kids playing uh, even at 11 o'clock in the street. N the, the, there is zero, uh, z literally zero crime. I mean, sometimes uh, excessive. I mean, uh, people lose their house, the keys of their house, uh, and they don't lock their house for 10 years. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I go on holiday. I, don't, I shouldn't say this. I go on holiday. I don't bother to lock my house. Really? Okay, yeah, because, uh, I mean, someone may need it. Uh, so it, 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 it sometimes is ridiculous. I mean, last time the police said, uh, okay, if you have a, a gold shop, okay, and you go to pray, lock the gold shop. I mean, don't leave it open. I mean, someone, you just encourage people to go... We will catch them within 10 meters that they have left the <laughs> shop <laughs> but it's it just uh, saves us so it, it, that's that's dubai it's really a place where uh, uh, you you can be at peace okay and, and this is islam you you can really actually nobody's going to to tell you okay you should do this you should do that okay it just that you see that actually it does work okay so why no, no, nobody wants to mess up Nobody wants to mess up with the. Uh, I mean, they, they want. They, I mean, there are lots of non-Muslims living in Dubai, and they have a full freedom to do everything that is legal. Okay, nobody wants to change the rules of Dubai uh, because it works. Hundred percent. Yeah. My 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 conclusion on Dubai, and I think I've pro probably shared this with you privately before, is that whatever you come to Dubai for is what you're going to get. Absolutely, absolutely. And I would say one thing that you know I've lived. Uh, back and forward, a good 13 years as a Muslim in London, okay? And you have all sorts of problems in London. Where do I pray? Okay, uh, where do I eat? Okay, you go to a washroom and you have a problem, okay? So this, uh, uh, all your friends, your colleagues, oh, let's go after work for a drink at the pub, okay? So you have all sorts of uh, uh, this kind of constantly pressure around you. Then you come to Dubai and all this suddenly goes away. But then you say, okay, I sorted out all the external part of Islam, okay? And then it gives you the, the, the then you start thinking about the inner, the inner dimension of Islam. Because there is so much what we would call dunya. There is so much uh, that you can get lost in the city, in the luxury, then you, you need to start putting yourself boundaries, okay? So you can spend all your money, all your salaries to have the best uh, lives that, that you want, but do you really want to have that? I mean, what does it really give you? Okay, you were talking about food, no? I mean, when I arrived here, who? I mean, every single day was a, a five-star restaurant. And of course, you put five, uh, <laughs> five, 10 kgs, okay. And then you start saying, you know what? I really don't need all this luxury. It's it, it just kind of too much. And then you start looking for simpler and simpler and simpler life, okay. That's the reason why when Ramadan comes, uh, uh, that imposes you to, you, you, you can actually not enjoy anything, okay. And then you start rediscovering the nightlife of Dubai. Mm. Okay, so when we went to pray at three o'clock, we went for a iftar. Then you, you know it was like a sohor. Yes. Okay, and then it says one o'clock. Hey guys, what do we do? Hey, let's go with the convertible to the mosque and let's go and pray a tahajjud. <laughs> not only taraweeh, but we pray also tahajjud. And uh, hey, stay not another couple of hours. We'll pray fajr. <laughs> and then, this is like a Dubai lifestyle. 100%. And it's alhamdulillah, it's so nice. Let's talk about Ramadan in particular for a bit, because yeah. I know that our viewers will be keen to understand the reality. Because when you're outside of, quote unquote, the Islamic world, uh, the the place you yearn to go to is uh, Saudi, for obvious reasons, right? In mm. Hanumain. But I found 
uh, is my first Ramadan in Dubai. In fact, it was my first Ramadan outside of the UK, full stop. Uh, and I just, I just had so much fun, you know, in, a, yeah. in an Islamic way. Yeah. Tell, tell us about or try to recreate Ramadan in Dubai for us. So what is it? I mean, of course, uh, uh, the fasting is the fasting. Okay, so you uh, you work a few hours, but the beautiful thing is that uh, they have uh, reduced hours. So the kids go to school late and they come back home uh, earlier. So you try to work during those hours and the rest uh, you, you, you uh, try to spend it with the family. I also like to have a small nap because I'm tired. Uh, uh, but uh, 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 there is that part. Okay, then you have uh, your, uh, your iftar with the family. Uh, you go to the mosque. Okay, you pray. No, actually, it depends, obviously, where if you really, really live close to the mosque, you can, you can actually go and pray the, the, the Maghrib and then uh, you come back. You have those uh, hours where you just kind of uh, recover your energies. And then the night and the day, the, really the, 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 the nightlife starts. Halal okay? nightlife. The halal nightlife. <laughs> okay, so you, it's important that obviously to do a little bit of exercise. I don't know, I go with my bicycle to the, to the mosque and uh, you pray your, uh, your uh, Isha Tarawih and then you need to have a karak chai. Okay, so everybody goes down and then you spread out in these cafes. Okay, and you just spend time with your friends. That's what you do. And then you call and you could organize a lot of things. And then the last, last 10 nights is really amazing because you literally spend the whole night between friends eating something and the mosque, whatever. And then one mosque has a tahajjud at one o'clock, one at three o'clock. And so the, the, the nightlife is, uh, the halal nightlife is absolutely unbelievable that you really don't want it to really end anymore. Yeah. I mean, once you really get used to this, you really want to have this uh, uh, for two months of Ramadan. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> In fact, the other night I actually said to my wife that I'm, I'm really missing Ramadan. Just you the, missed just Ramadan, the night time, yeah. Just the night time, yeah. because it's amazing. And the, the, the thing actually that really astounded me was the and i don't know why it astounded me but it's the quality of the the massage the quality of the reciters like we're talking like really you know mashallah really 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 high quality yeah but they organize this i mean they always they bring uh, people uh, 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 people with a very very good voice just to make it uh, uh, nicely of course uh, and because there are also there are non muslims so they listen to the quran the recitation of the quran and uh, so it's very important i mean if you ask us many new converts well, why did you convert because i like the voice of the azan Okay, so there's a, so th th there is a, a little bit of a staging of the of the whole uh, in a halal way. I mean, to put a, a, someone with a beautiful voice is not like uh, it's okay. You put on the best show, right? Yeah, you put on the best show. Even in the mosque, I mean, if you do the mosque in uh, in downtown, for example, I mean, you can just go and say, "Wow, this is really beautiful." Yeah. <laughs> but but it's an important point because you know not many people outside of Dubai would understand that there is such a focus on. The Islam, like there are centralized organizations here that do a lot of things. Like you say, they they are the ones that organize the reciters to come. The, you know, the masajid are beautiful, very well maintained. They they're not allowed to become outdated. You know, the, it's it's just it's just amazing. I mean, if you if you look for example, uh, the Ramadan starts okay as the month of charity. Okay, mm. so the ruler of Dubai says, "I will go to donate. I mean, let's donate one billion meals." And it, obviously, it should be big. No, it's going to be one million. It's with one billion. Okay, and then because we are like a, a smart city, everything is on apps. So you go around, iftar. Okay, let me donate one uh, one iftar. Uh, uh, everything it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's fast. Okay, so even the all the okay oh, three days before I need to pay my zakat uh, al-fitr. Uh, okay, boom up and you pay. So everything is uh, like organized and things get get done properly yeah, yeah. so e no, e even even the uh the friday right the the khutbah the app you get the you yes. get the khutbah it's in english it's in other languages yeah, yeah i send you the translation yeah. in english so you can listen actually you you, you understand what uh, saying everything standardized so yeah it's good Mashallah, it's amazing. and and of course uh, there are also uh, uh um, i mean if you want to study uh, there are uh, lessons there are uh, there are uh, study groups, so everybody it's kind of uh, organizing itself uh, 
to, to, to continue the, 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 the learning. Uh, I want to talk about, we talked about bottoms before mm -hmm. uh, of the market. And right now we're filming in mid-May 2023. Yes. And we're at a very interesting time right now. And I wanted to get your overall thoughts on life, and investments and the markets right now so markets finance we talk finance okay so uh, as i was saying uh, uh, there is this saying in english that uh, the night is darkest before dawn okay the problem is that the sun has not yet set okay so this is the way i feel and uh, again we live uh, in uh, in a globalized uh, markets so the fate of financial markets uh, is uh, linked to the monetary policies okay of uh, the country that uh, is uh, spending in excess and is accumulating debt and uh, when they decide to increase the interest rates and uh, 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 reduce the, the, the liquidity in the financial markets. Uh, usually, I mean, we were. If you go back uh, to when this uh, uh, this dance of injecting liquidity and reducing started, uh, every single time they try to control it, there is a financial crash. Maybe a couple of times they managed to control it. So. This is now uh, a, a big, uh, uh, a big worry. It's a big worry that uh, we might be just uh, the last hour before uh, a, a, a financial a financial crash. Even in two thousand and six, they the, after the excesses of uh, the previous uh, uh, five six years, uh, following the the, the dot com bubble and the injection of uh, excess li liquidity in the system, there was a feeling that, yeah, we increase the interest rates and uh, we, might, uh, we might do it. And then you got Bear Stern goes bang, bust, and then uh, Lehman Brothers goes bust, and the financial system goes to collapse. If the governments didn't intervene, we would have, the, 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 the ATMs would have stopped, the lights would have switched off, literally. Of the economy, so again now there is this feeling that uh, we 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 should make it. So the base assumption we should make it, okay, uh, but there is a, a probability that uh, it could be end up in a big crash. And what does that mean for the average person? What does it mean for the average person? The average person means uh, rise of unemployment, losing your job, losing your house. That's uh, that's uh, what can a financial crash uh, can mean. Worst case scenario, you could have, I mean, already you have some international wars. So the worst case scenario, you can have international uh, uh, conflicts. So, but this is, as I said, it's a tail risk. Okay, the base assumption is that we should get uh, through this phase, maybe a little bit of a recession towards the end of this year. And then uh, hopefully liquidity will start coming back into the markets and uh, uh, the financial markets will uh, will recover. But this I said at the moment, it really feels good. That for the average person, it really feels good. I mean, when people talk about a recession, they talk about a real, uh, a, a real economy. I mean, uh, excluding of inflation. But if you add inflation, so maybe your salary increases by, I don't know, 5%. There is inflation at 10%. The reality, you are 5% poorer, but you don't realize it because you say, oh, well, I just got a 5% uh, pay rise. Okay, so... The the, the 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 hope is that uh, the, the 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 wave of bankruptcies will not uh, will not start. The property market uh, will hold uh, its value. The value of the property market is based on uh, trillions of dollars of mortgages. Okay, if people start defaulting on their mortgages, if uh, the banks don't give any more mortgages, uh, the value of the properties uh, will collapse. Because uh, who is going to who can afford to buy a property, whether it's a commercial or residential, without uh, uh, a mortgage? Very few people, and those few people that can will offer you fifty percent of the value of your of your property. So that that's what uh, it means. And is that the time to swoop in? Well, a, 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 a clever investor that knows how to navigate this cycle, okay, will 
never use uh, leverage anyway. Okay, certainly not uh, at this point uh, of the of the cycle, and should not have used it uh, over the last uh, uh, couple of years. And we'll have uh, will preserve buying power, will preserve uh, uh, liquidity, and wait for a crash to buy. So that's uh, uh, you need to be patient, but that's the time where uh, you you build your portfolio, whether it's equities, where it's uh, where it's properties. Uh, yeah. So that's what you would do. And and right now, so thinking about the different asset classes, you've got, you know, the equities, real estate, et cetera. Um, how are you, are you seeing it all as one thing or are you seeing there's an opportunity that's going to come here, there's an opportunity that's going to come there and also geographically, right? Because, for example, here, is there a specific opportunity that's going to arise? Okay, so let no, I don't see it all as one opportunity. Uh, first of all, I see a distinction between the financial or traded markets and uh, the private markets. So the financial markets already have taken a quite a good beating uh, last year. So like stock markets? And like stock markets, yeah. Let's talk obviously about halal uh, Sharia compliance uh, equities. So we don't talk about bonds. I mean, there's no point in, in discussing about what opportunities in the in, in these asset classes. So there are already uh, uh, interesting opportunities to buy uh, blue chip companies uh, at uh, much better valuations than they were uh, at the beginning of last year. Okay. Any that take your particular fancy? Sorry? Any that take your fancy? This is not adve- investing advice. Oh, no, but- no, nothing in particular. I mean, uh, you typically go to the bl- blue chips. Uh, so you take the, say, the top, uh, the, the top 100 uh, uh, halal uh, stock by, by market cap, and uh, either you buy them or you buy uh, an ETF. Okay. Uh, of course, it would have been better uh, if you bought uh, last uh, October, okay? Uh, but if we are going to, to have uh, another uh, dip in the market, I don't know, another correction of 5 10%, or you have a financial crash, okay? And it goes down by 25 30 40%. I want to scare you, but this thing can happen, okay? Then, yeah, of course, you, 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 you can go and buy uh, these uh, blue chip companies, uh, at that point, I mean, there is no point when you have a financial crash in doing like stock picking selections because uh, everything is be it's for it's for, uh, it's for sale. Private markets is different. Private markets, uh, and here I mean uh, private equity, uh, real estate, and infrastructure, they have really not corrected much. UK commercial property market has corrected, okay, and uh, could it could offer an opportunity to 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 deploy capital. Okay, but there is no rush at all. European markets are co- continuing to correct. U.S. markets have not corrected at all. Okay, and and there's a big big uh, uh, debate within uh, within the industry as to why the valuers have not uh, co- uh, lowered the, the valuations of the of the properties. There are there have not been enough transactions. Uh, it, it it might happen over the next uh, few years. So I would certainly focus right now. On, uh, uh, on liquid markets. As to the regions, uh, that's a very interesting uh, interesting observation that I will... Uh, uh, th- you see, over the last few years, as more and more money went into the uh, financial markets, into the stock market, everything became highly correlated. So it was very, very difficult to pick one sector over one over another sector to pick one 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 company over another company over one country over another country okay now certain bets bets I mean bets certain investments worked very well so if you invested in a theme like technology 10 years ago or the rise of e-commerce uh, biotech uh, so this type of investments outperformed the market okay uh, but if you look at the short-term basis in terms of correlation, everything was very much uh, uh, correlated. So it was just a different, uh, what we call it, beta. Okay. Uh, the, the, but lately, we have started seeing uh, the, the correlation between uh, countries breaking down. So it, it might make sense uh, to look at one country over another country. We don't know how long it will last, 
but uh, 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 there are uh, the, the, there are different dynamics uh, uh, a country a country level so it might be worth uh, for uh, someone who uh, is building a portfolio to to actually look beyond your uh, your country and says okay what's happening in france or what's happening in, uh, in in switzerland what's happening in italy in the us one thing that however i am still in doubt is whether to allocate equities to emerging markets mm. let let's leave aside uh, the gcc and uh, uh, dubai in particular because yes you can call them technically emerging markets but when you come here <laughs> everything's emerged <laughs> I, I think everything has uh, uh, emerged so let's leave them dubai, in general dubai and, and saudi uh, aside for a moment but when you talk about the big emerging markets like uh, I mean, what, which are, if you look at the MSCI uh, uh, Emerging Market Index, what do you find? China, India, Russia, and Brazil. Okay. So Russia is clearly uninvestable right now. Mm. Okay. I don't think you can, even with the, I mean, I, I was looking on Bloomberg at one, uh, one Russian stocks, and there is a warning is that, look, this guy, you can't trade it. <laughs> okay. So India... I don't know. The, the, it's a market that I invested at the beginning when it emerged. And then with the devaluation of the rupee, I just didn't understand anymore what, what was happening in that market. China, it's, there is now a huge geopolitical risk. Okay, so if you want to do a contrarian investment and you say, okay, I go to China because I believe that they will not end up in a conflict with the US, then it, 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 on paper it's cheap. But if you have a conflict in Taiwan, how can you invest in, uh, in China? Uh, uh, in Brazil, uh, it's too far away. I just don't know what's going on <laughs> uh, 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 over there. So these are the big emerging markets. So when you want to allocate money to emerging markets, this is what it is. I mean, there was a talk in the late, uh, when before the financial crisis about frontier market. So I was in, at the time I was working for ABN Ambro, and we were opening brokerage accounts everywhere, uh, Pakistan, Nigeria. Okay, because uh, what is the next? Uh, oh, let's launch a product, Vietnam Index Tracker. I, I, because I was obviously uh, managing the Islamic desk, for, uh, for me, happy days. I created the Al-Hilal Index. Okay, so I created, uh, I was able to access uh, countries from Morocco all the way to Indonesia. And I added even India and China since there were uh, hundreds of millions of Muslims. So I created the Al-Hilal Index. It was like uh, booming. Right? Literally, I, I, I invested uh, maybe one and a half billion dollars. It's all done. It's all gone. I mean, nobody is uh, it's, it's thinking anymore about this... Uh, markets being the, the next opportunity. Uh, so yeah, so I don't know about emerging markets right now. I, I wouldn't, personally, I'm not allocating money to emerging markets. I've just allocated myself to Dubai. <laughs> okay, that's my, 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 my physical investment myself. I put myself in Dubai. So that's my only emerging market exposure. <laughs> just yourself and your family. And now the, there is a Saudi pivot, pivot to Saudi. Okay, so I am spending half of my time in Dubai, half of my time in, in Saudi, because what's happening there, it's very, very interesting. The country is opening up, and uh, if they get it right, that will be very, very interesting. Do you think Saudi is the next Dubai? Uh, I don't know. I mean, Dubai is unique, okay, but, uh, I mean, they've open up the visa. I mean, everybody can go the, the, these days to Saudi. Okay, so at the very minimum, we should go. Everybody should go. Now, we've been traveling to Saudi. I mean, the first time I went to 96, I went, I went on, on Hajj. Okay, that was the first time I went, to, I went to Saudi. And it was always a pain. It was always a pain to go in and out of that country. They were saying that once Hajj was very difficult because you had to travel thousands of miles on, the, on a camelback. And uh, now... It's very easy to fly, but the, 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 during those days, the, the organization, I mean, to go to Jeddah airport, to Mecca, the first time it took me 24 hours. I was just, it must be very far. And then I look on the map, and it's only 20 <laughs> minutes my car. <laughs> it was a disaster. Nowadays, uh, I mean, you don't even need a Humra visa, if I understand correctly. Uh, you, you can just, just go there, show up, and you go for, uh, for Umra. So the, the, certainly the tourist sector, the religious tourist sector, it's booming. I mean, honestly, too much, okay? 
I was there on Umbra. I went in, in November. It was crowded. People that were in Umbra, they did Umbra during Ramadan. They said, uh, I don't know, like two and a half million. Yeah, 2.6 million. 2.6. On, on, on the 27th night, I think there were 2.6 million. So they are, I mean, they are opening, but I think that they are just figuring out, okay, but really how many people? Because I've seen some projection. They wanted to see five to eight million people to do uh, Hajj. But I think that they... The infrastructure still cannot uh, cannot cope for uh, all those people, um, but then there is the whole country. I mean, the whole country is open now for investments. So there is uh, sectors like education, uh, healthcare. I am personally looking at agriculture, hospitality, service apartments. So, uh, and, and the, I mean, you send an email to the to the Ministry of Investments. Boom! Within a few minutes, someone answered you. Yes, yeah, sure. You want to open a company here? I am your uh, uh, Mr. I'm Fahad. It's my mobile number. Call me. Come and see me, and we will help you to to That's do great it. Great customer service. So I'm already opening two companies, in uh, actually three, in uh, in Saudi Arabia. So it, it will be interesting time. And the peace. We, I mean, this announcement that they've they've made that they've kind of uh, their approachment with Iran. Okay, this is like a game changer. This is a game changer. I mean, you don't have to look anymore. Is it a kind of a drone? I mean, the, the worst thing you can do is like you're ending jet and there were Patriot missiles uh, uh, next to the, the runaway. Okay, that was scary. Okay. <laughs> but you do, you just do Bismillah. So you, anyway, I'm doing it for... If I die doing this, I probably will become Shahid. Okay. But now, I mean, this, this rapprochement that's kind of reopening uh, everything here. As someone who's lived in Dubai during the development period... Are you are you seeing any parallels, or do you just absolutely, uh, absolutely? I mean, there is a company called Downtown. Down, it's a company called Downtown uh, Riyadh. I mean, they are uh, really, yeah, not coping, but I mean, they, they. This is an inspiration. Dubai is a blueprint. I mean, if you can recreate the ten Dubai's, certainly the, the financing is there. The money is there. Okay, uh, 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 you, you can recreate. I mean, th there is a lot of. But I mean, a city like Riyadh, for example, it's very large, so it'll take a huge investment so to rebuild the, the infrastructure. But one thing about Riyadh, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a kingdom. So if the king says, okay, I, this uh, 50 square mi miles have to be raised to the ground and rebuilt, that, that, that will be done. Mm. They will do it. Um, one thing I want to ask you about is the, if you, if you think about the world and the state of the world, and broadly, East and West. And of course, the West has always been the predominant player. And of course, you've seen that through your financial career as well. Are you seeing the pendulum swing? Uh, yeah, okay. If you leave it to its own momentum, yes. Okay, the pendulum was swinging towards China, towards the East, okay? The question is that uh, the West doesn't like it, okay? Because uh, uh, China... Uh, wants to assert, assert itself uh, as an international uh, uh, global player, okay? And this is clashing with uh, uh, with the West, okay? Uh, so, as I said, on its own momentum it will do, uh, but probably there will be a lot of resistance for the pendulum to to, to swing. And the, hopefully, I mean, the only place where you want to be is really Dubai, because Dubai has a, or the UAE has a, like a, Zero problem policy. We don't want to have problems with anybody. <laughs> we want to be friends with everybody. You know, we are, there is an Abraham Accord, okay? The, the, the UAE is a part of that. Mm. So, and, and if you really hear, I mean, there was an interview on BBC of Sheikh Mohammed, okay? And he talked about this. And he said, okay, guys, referring to, the, to, the, 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 is to Israel, okay? Let's make peace. He is, I mean, I'm not saying myself. He said it in publicly, okay? Give a state to the Palestinian, the Arab world will open up for you and you will enjoy the benefits. And you, now you can see I mean, how many Israelis, uh, tourists are uh, in Dubai. I mean, everywhere you go. And uh, I mean, there was a last time they were even the, the Orthodox who were doing like one of their like dance in uh, under Burj Khalifa. I'm so happy. I mean, sometimes when I see the, 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 the them I come here, I want to talk to them. I mean, I say, hey, do you like peace? Okay, this is peace. Okay, let's enjoy it. 
okay? Guys, we've been like uh, living together for thousands of years, okay? You have prospered. We, have, we uh, the, the, the Jewish community, they've prospered in the Islamic world. I mean, uh, there's no need of having a war. We, we can actually be peace. There can be peace. So yeah, that's this. This is the reason why I I like the the uh, 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 to be here. Okay, this is really the the center of peace. You know, in Abu Dhabi there is this place where they built a mosque, a synagogue, and a church together. And the beautiful thing is that they went to call the mosque the uh, uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus Mosque. I mean, where do you find? I mean, a mosque with the name Mary. Hey, that's amazing, no? So Rogero, on the car journey here, you trailered a story to me that you wanted to save for this podcast, <laughs> which I've not heard. And it's about your second conversion to Absolutely. Islam. You talked about the first conversion yes. in the first podcast. Now tell me about the second. So when I came to Dubai, I obviously I was traveling to Saudi all the time and I needed to a visa. And uh, in the visa, there was a section, religion. And the first time that I asked my secretary to, to apply for the visa, she put Christian. And I asked her, why do you put Christian? I said, oh, you are such a good boy, you're Italian. Don't tell your Muslim, that you're Christian. Okay. So I kept going with this visa in and out of Saudi Arabia, Christian, and it was bothering me. Uh, and every time I was renewing it, it was always the renewed Christian, Christian. So one day I went to the, I went to the, to the embassy uh, I mean, there is, a, uh, there is an office. Uh, and I said, excuse me, I'm Muslim. Can you please change it? I said, uh, you, you need to show, your passport is Italian. You need to show a, a certificate of conversion. She says, okay, I have it. I got it in Malaysia. Oh, but it's in Bahasa. Um, uh, 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 you need to get it translated, attested at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Okay, well, you know what? I'm going to get the new one. So, I, I asked my Emirati colleague, says, can you please uh, accompany me to the, is, uh, uh, to, the, to the Islamic Affairs Department? I need a, a conversion. I knew because my, my wife had also had done her conversion. So we, he, dro he drove me and we went there. So I said, excuse me, I, I really need to, to have uh, this uh, conversion certificate because I need to go to Saudi Arabia. He said, ah, but we need to go for the whole procedure. The said, says, okay, let's go for a procedure. So he takes me through the whole uh, explanation about Islam. And then he, he, he says, okay, now you need to say the shahada. Okay, I shahadu Allah, ilaha illallah, shahadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And then he said, congratulations. <laughs> now you are Muslim and all your sins are forgiven. I felt so good. So I got my certificate and I said to Tariq, as we were going out, Tariq, you know what? We should get this done every year. <laughs> <laughs> just wipe it, wipe it clean every year. We, just can, we can go, actually. We can go. <laughs> we, we, it has been a few years. So we got to get a, a, a new certificate of conversion. And then, because, you see, it makes me feel like, oh, wow, this is how I feel when you become new Muslim. All your sins are forgiven. So this was the story of my second convention. <laughs> Mashallah. Now, one of the um, things that comes up uh, a lot when I speak to um, people who have converted from other religi religions to Islam is there's always, uh, after the dust settles down, uh, there's always a, a yearning or a desire to bring all of your loved ones uh, into Islam as well. Because of course you want, you know, you want the best for the people that you love. And I've heard from other people uh, who have been in that situation that sometimes you can be overzealous initially and then you kind of, you learn to be a bit more uh, measured. Um, what's, what's your experience been like in terms of bringing those around you uh, into, into Islam? So, I mean, exactly like uh, 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 every, every uh, revert, uh, I went through this uh, process that you are describing. First, uh, you announce it, shock, and and then you slowly start uh, talking about it, and then the voices rises and you start uh, arguing, okay, and then at some point when the the voice reach uh, a, a pitch too high, you have to stop and say, maybe that was my 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 journey. Okay, there must be a point where you have to accept that maybe the, the, the journey of your parents, of your sister, 
uh, or your wife, for example, or your husband, okay, is not a journey that will take them to uh, to the to the dean, okay. And uh, you have to accept it, accept it. But at the same time, I mean, it's a personal journey, okay. So you're you you are in your journey, but uh, you have a duty and a responsibility to behave as a good person. So. In my case, I was a very, I was, I wasn't a good, uh, I was like a, what you you cl would classify as a bad boy before Islam. So Islam makes me a good a good person, and brings back to my to my parents the son that they didn't have for the previous uh, uh, like seven eight years. Okay, of so for them at least they had a good son. Okay, what do I do? The first thing I do, Mama, I said, your financial problems are solved in this moment. From now on, you are on my payroll. And I start, uh, first of all, I give 100,000 euros, because obviously I was earning well, 100,000 euros in her bank account, and then 2,000 euros a month extra, just uh, a, a, a cent. So in, in, in one day, I, I solved uh, her uh, financial problems. And then uh, I said, uh, you know, Mama, what my the prophet said? He said, paradise is under the foot of uh, your mother. You know, this prophet, uh, he said, this prophet was a really a good person. <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, and then it's it. You just basically, have, you just have the best possible example and then leave it to, to Allah to, to guide them. In my case, they both died. They didn't, uh, certainly not, they didn't accept uh, uh, Islam, but I continue to pray. I continue to pray, and uh, uh, you know I have dreams. I always have dreams since I was a kid. So, and I believe in my dreams, especially when they they have a certain things. So, in the first dream, I saw my father being drawn in the in a river of hell by two angels. Okay, and I was on the other side of this river, and I I, I saw his his eyes of desperation. Why didn't you warn me? I said, no, I did warn you. He didn't listen to me. Okay, and I was very, I was very sad, and I was praying and praying and praying. And then I had another dream. Okay, and in this dream, I was with my whole family. And, uh, you know, when the, you're kids, and, so, sorry, when you have kids and you do the helicopter, okay, and I dreamt that uh, my father was doing the helicopter to me, and I experienced that sense of happiness uh, that a four- or five-year-old child can experience. Uh, and my, my mother was laughing, and my father was laughing. And I was a kid, but I said, you see, I told you that I was, uh, that we would have, end up, that the, 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 the paradise was true, and we would have ended up all in hell. Okay. Sorry, no, no, <laughs> in heaven. Okay, and uh, in, uh, so I took that uh, that uh, dream as my answer to where my parents. Uh, I mean, where the uh, the state of the soul uh, is. I mean, hopefully, hopefully, it's a vision. Okay, but I hope it's probably the vision for me. Okay, because you know uh, there is some 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 people have always, have always asked uh, the question of. Uh, the Quran says that I mean, when when you or the Islam says that when you you I mean if you are admitted to Jannah you will be uh, 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 reunited with your uh, family members your father your children but someone asked them, but what about if they were bad people and they were uh, in hell how do you solve this mm. well you know you, unity is something that we experience uh, or singularity is what you experience in in our life in in the in that other dimension it might be possible that both things happen that their soul is really in hell but you are given a new parents in which you believe that i mean they, may, they might be your uh, your parents i don't know how to really i'm not a scholar but uh, i listen to this explanation and uh, i do hope first of all i hope they go to paradise okay and i do hope to have the experience of being reunited with uh, uh, with my parents and and that will be the reality that will be the the reality so i will not be thinking that oh maybe there is a version of my parents that it's in uh, in hell no, no, that will be my reality and that's what i hope to 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 experience amazing Subhanallah. Uh, but sorry i'm not a, really a, a, a scholar so i just talk about my personal uh, journey and experience it is not 
It's not financial advice. It's not financial <laughs> advice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like in the financial advice, I have to put a huge disclaimer. Uh, please notice I'm not a scholar. I'm not qualified to give any fatwa. I just talk about my life. Uh, uh, for every for every fatwa, please refer to the... the, the, the <laughs> not up. the financial, the experienced financial advisor referred to a mufti. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, it's been amazing having you uh, again, Ruggiero. And uh, I hope, uh, inshallah, our audience have enjoyed it as much as I have. Until the next time, Salaamu Alaikum. Alaikum.